Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to the uh, 4 o'clock space tourism session. My name is Peter Diamandis. I'm the uh, first speaker and coordinator for the session. Uh, our lineup this afternoon and our plan is I'll be speaking first. I also serve as the uh, chairman and president of the XPRIZE Foundation. Uh, after me, uh, Colette Bevis will be speaking, who is the vice president director. Uh, Tom Rogers, president of the Stockholm Foundation, and uh, also a trustee of the XPRIZE Foundation, Larry Roberts, and Rand Sinberg, and I'll be introducing them each separately. Uh, the plan is to have uh, 10 minute uh, opening remarks and then to engage in a hopefully very active discussion with the, uh, with the audience. We also have some fun video for you. Uh, before I begin, let me introduce uh, Eric Anderson in the back. Eric, if you raise your hand. Uh, Eric has information on the X Prize, and anybody who would like additional information, please give Eric your business card or address, and we have a, a very nice package that we'd be happy to send out to you. And with that, let's begin. First question, how many people here do not want to go into space someday? Yeah, I'll assume everybody else does. The basic question is how are we going to go? Uh, space tourism, uh, until recently, even today, is laughed at by many people. It's thought of as something which is a curiosity, something as Buck Rogers. But I want to remind you that 30 years ago, during the Apollo era, when we were growing up, many of us were growing up with miracles happening, it was something that was not a, an if, but a when. It was something which was going to happen. And somehow, over the last 30 years, we have let that slip through our fingers. What has happened is that what has been naturally our right as human beings, as explorers, and as many of the audience here, tax-paying citizens of the U.S., who saw in eight years the first human flying from the Earth's surface into orbit, Yuri Gagarin, April 12, 1961, to Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, eight years later going to the moon. Miracles happened. And if you remember, the projected time frame after the Apollo landing was that we'd have colonies on the moon, by the late 80s, and by this point, colonies on Mars. But somewhere along the line, the engine that was fueling that activity, was fueling our activities in space, our progress, died. And that engine was political competition between the US and the Soviet Union, and it went away or was transformed into other forms called Star Wars and other things. But our dreams, unfortunately, went away with it. So 35 years later today, there is not a single program that I know of that is creating a vehicle to take you up as space tourists. And the question is, how do we change that? How do we make it possible for us to go? Now the question is, why is that important? important? Why is space tourism, other than it's fun to go, why is it critical? How many here have heard of Gerard K. O'Neill? Please raise your hand. Uh, Dr. O'Neill, for many people here, uh, was a father of the populist space movement. Jerry had a very clear vision of where the human race would go with solar power satellites and lunar mining facilities and O'Neill colonies, and it's a beautiful vision, one which we will fulfill. The only question in Jerry's plan was how do we get from ground zero, Earth orbit, sea level, into space in a recurring, low cost, and reliable fashion. And in Jerry's book, High Frontier, he wrote about 
the promises of the space shuttle, which have not happened. And his plan of solar power satellites requiring lunar facilities to mine the moon and get oxygen and aluminum and silicon and creating a space-based infrastructure for construction is a great plan and it will work. But not until we have low-cost, reusable water systems that carry people. Getting low-cost rockets into space is not good enough. Because if they're not built for carrying people, they're not going to help expand the human race into space. So I want to connect in your mind space tourism as an economic engine to help fulfill those dreams that we have. This year, 1.5 billion people, 1.5 billion people will fly as passengers. I should say that, right? 1.5 billion passengers will fly in 1996. That's the equivalent of the entire human race in the early 1900s when the Wright brothers flew their first airplane. It's a $250 billion industry today. That's an economic engine, folks. And that's the same type of economic engine we want to create through space tourism. So I want you to view space tourism as something which is not only fun, but which will establish an economic engine to open up the frontier that we, as a human species, will develop and explore. Um, with that as opening remarks, I'm going to say a few words about the X Prize and then turn it over to uh, Colette Bevis to uh, speak a little bit about it. Uh, the X Prize is a, a completely private effort whose purpose it is is to reintroduce competition. You know, we are now in an era of the 90s where cooperation is every place. And cooperation is great, but the fact of the matter is competition is even better. It is something which should be viewed as a positive force. Because competition is what we, as humans, have lived with for millions of years. We compete against nature. We compete against each other. We compete against friends. We compete. It drives us forward. Competition is not bad. Constructive competition is good. And so we grew into our space program today because we compete with the Soviets. It's time to reintroduce that into space. And I hope you will uh, help carry that forward. And I'm going to now uh, play video uh, video player for Colette. Let me introduce Colette Bevis. She is the director and vice president of the X Prize Foundation. Uh, Colette grew up in a place that knows competition well, and that's Alaska, on the, the, uh, the base of Mount McKinley. Uh, in the early uh, to mid-1980s, Colette was the director of really the first private uh, space tourism effort called uh, Project Space Voyage, along with T.C. Schwartz at Sci Expeditions. Um, and she'll tell you that about that in a little bit. If you please welcome Colette Bevis. brought some of our home movies to show you, so I hope you don't mind. I, I had something I was going to talk about, and I sort of changed my mind listening to Peter and looking at all of you. Uh, I grew up in a tourism business. We were the only lodge at the base of Mount McKinley. It was 300 miles to the nearest neighbor, and over 42 miles, excuse me, 42 miles to the nearest neighbor, 300 miles to town. And there were two mountain ranges that were 18,000 feet high that we used to have to try to get over to uh, go check our mail or go anywhere. And in the summertime, for three months out of the year, we would have people that would come to Alaska to look at the wonder and visit the mountain. And it was a very exciting thing. So I come from a real space tourism type background. We had lots of space. And uh, there were so many stars in Alaska that I was very surprised. I remember the first time when I was 15 years old and I went to Seattle. And I looked up in the sky and I saw the Big Dipper. And I went, what do they do with all the stars? And I think I've spent my whole life trying to find the stars again. And when Peter was talking, I realized that we have more people at this conference, visiting this conference, than have been up in space. The astronauts were telling us that there's a little over 300 people that have been in space. And I think we all have a right to at least go touch a star or look a little closer at one. But the uh, X Prize is something that Peter 
read a book a couple years ago and said, you know, I think we should have some competition in this space. And I thought that would be a great idea. Byron Lichtenberg and I decided we'd help him have, have that happen. We had our opening debut for the X Prize last weekend on the 18th in St. Louis. We had 20 astronauts. We had aerospace and aviation luminaries like Bert and Tam. Uh, the Lindbergh grandsons, Eric and Morgan Lindbergh, were there. And I would like to take a minute to show you our video news release. And it kind of says a lot better than my words and pictures. Sorry, there's no popcorn. As Lori Garber said, uh, we are yuppies trying to get into space, I guess. Maybe I'll show you some pictures. The Wright brothers captured man's dream of light. Charles Lindbergh showed that commercial air travel was practical. And when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon, they proved the American can-do spirit. But even with monthly shuttle flights, space travel today remains far from routine. Nowhere can you buy a ticket to space as a tourist. Now there is the X Prize, a $10 million international competition to find the first team to safely launch and land a vehicle capable of transporting three people on two consecutive flights to an altitude of 100 kilometers. 69 years ago, Charles Lindbergh and Sprint St. Louis changed the way people thought about air travel. Today, the X Prize Foundation is trying to change the way people think about space travel. Lindbergh received his financing from the business leader of St. Louis, and today, the X Prize Foundation is up and running because once again, that same spirit in St. Louis. The X Prize Foundation nonprofit education group promoting private advancement in space announced the organization of the International Space Race in St. Louis. NASA Administrator Dan Golden and more than 20 astronauts and aviation leaders gathered with St. Louis business leaders in a show of support for the foundation. We encourage participation by as many people, as many organizations in this noble venture. And I hope my grandson Zachary, who is two years old, be able to go with his children on a trip to a Luna Hotel. Today, private industry, in cooperation with NASA, is developing technology which private teams can harness to compete for the X Prize. This rocket, the DC X, is a reusable launch vehicle. It is currently being developed and tested. Arthur C. Clark, the author of 2001 The Space Odyssey and the father of the communication satellite, spoke at the X-Prize announcement on videotape. The X-Prize will be introduced in a constructive fashion to the competition. And the industry is very happy to support it. It's perhaps the first small but crucial step towards the European space. The X-Prize winners will go down in history as heroes and pioneers, following in the footsteps of the Wright brothers, Charles Lindbergh, and others. This is John Newton's report. And I'm here to ask all of you to help work with us to make the X Prize possible. I have here in my hand one of the many entries that we're starting to get for people who want to build and actually compete for the X Prize and think that it's a doable thing that they can do. In St. Louis, we have some very key partners that are working with us. And you may ask, why did we launch, I'll back up a little bit, you may ask, why did we launch ourselves in the X Prize Foundation in St. Louis? We're following the formula that worked for Charles Lindbergh. He went to St. Louis and he said, hey, we've got a crazy idea. I want to fly over to New York. And there were some very visionary businessmen in St. Louis that said, I think we can find the money. I think we can figure out a way to make it happen. And we also have a very good friend in St. Louis, Doug King, who's in the audience. He is uh, the past director of the Challenger Centers. He also uh, said to us when he got a new job in St. Louis at the St. Louis Science Center, hey, Peter, why don't you come and talk to me a little bit about doing the X Prize in St. Louis? So that's part of the reason we are there. That's Doug King.
we also uh, have a very interesting little bit of video to show you about the progression of aviation prizes and what makes up a prize. We start in the early 1920s.
The estimated cost of spending a week at the Orbital Hilton, including shuttle service to the hotel and back to Earth, is $50,000. Experts estimate that the commercial space tourism market is going to top the $1 billion mark by 2004. In other news today, the Walt Disney Company announced that it is relocating its corporate headquarters to St. Louis. To join the <laughs> States 
and the former Soviet Union that drove so far, so fast. It's almost impossible to realize that it was from your years fighting 61 to landing on the moon only eight years. The X Prize will reintroduce in a constructive fashion this element of competition. And for this reason, I'm very happy to support it. It's perhaps the first small but crucial step towards the opening up of space. Uh, to quote from Charles Lindbergh himself, and I see you have this in your handsome brochure, the important thing is to start, to lay a plan, and then to follow it step by step, no matter how small or large, each one by itself may see. Well, I hereby invite teams from every nation in the world to lay their plans and to begin the competition for the X Prize. May the best team win. This is Arthur Clark signing off in Sri Lanka, wishing you an enjoyable evening in St. Louis, never be known as the gateway to the stars. I would like, um, as part of my introduction of our next speaker, uh, to say that two and a half years ago, we can put the lights back up if someone could back up. Two and a half years ago, when we started the X Prize concept, uh, it was a far out idea, and for some, it's still a far out idea. But we pulled together a group of individuals who were early believers, and we formed what was known as the X Prize, uh, the X Prize Committee. And we have a few here in the room tonight I'd like to recognize. Uh, we have uh, Charlie Schaefer. Charlie is the president of Celestis, or founder of Celestis. Doug King. Doug. And uh, I know Lori Garber is a member, and I don't think she's here, and Bill Gobax. And uh, at this dinner, and Larry Roberts, excuse me. Uh, at this dinner, uh, we chose to uh, to uh, celebrate those X Prize committee members and give them a small gift. Um, and unfortunately, we, because of all the conflicts, Tom Rogers was not able to be there. And we'd like to uh, to present this to him here tonight. I'd like, however, to introduce Tom in a slightly different fashion. Uh, Tom has backed two ventures uh, of mine. I'm very proud of that. And um, I hope to embarrass you greatly with this. Time. Uh, he was the first individual ever to give financial support to the International State University back now uh, 10 years ago, 1986, 87. And he was also the very first person to provide financial contribution towards the X-Prize Foundation. And Tom, for that, we thank you very much. Colette uh, designed a small medallion, which we presented to our financial backers and our brain trust. And uh, I'd like to hang that around uh, Tom's neck at this point. <laughs> Don't mess up his hair, dude. <laughs> we welcome the President of the Space Transportation Association and the President of the Southland Foundation, the man who's been speaking about space tourism for the better part of 10 years, Tom Rogers. He said, ETs, if they're out there, 
and they know about us, and they know the circumstances that we find ourselves in, and they haven't helped, well, I say, the hell with them. Thirty years ago, 1966, we put the first world satellite communication system into being. And I was always being responsible for that at the time. And by uh, extraordinary coincidence, a uh, close professional acquaintance of mine, Herman Kahn, came by to talk with me. And uh, Herman was a man who in those days known as the man who thought about the unthinkable. He worked for the Rand Corporation and was studying a large number of the awful characteristics of the potential in the continental nuclear war. And we agreed on two things. This was the uh, midst of the Mercury, Gemini, Apollo era. One, that neither her nor I would outlive the demise of the Soviet Union. <laughs> we also agreed that as soon as that happened, all of the uh, drive and the technology made available to help do that would of course be used to open up space to the general public. Wrong, wrong. Uh, ten years later, after, uh, uh, I remember talking with uh, Herman again, and Herman wrote a paper for NASA with a broader study about space looking ahead over the next century or so, or so. And he by that had concluded that space tourism would be one of the greatest uh, businesses in the country we so said. He might just as well have stayed in bed. Ten years after that, uh, I and some other men in Washington formed an organization called Space Public, the not the profit. And those of us who put it together were Bud Evans, who'd been in the Reagan White House, uh, Chuck Matthews, who ran the Gemini program, Jack Harrington, who was the chief engineer at Comsat, Michael Collins, who, along with uh, Armstrong and Oldham, and uh, was uh, up on the moon, at the moon. And the object of the game was to start asking ourselves the questions about the general public going up in space. What about sickness? What about fear? What about clothing? Food? Water? Insurance? And we searched out Jim Banks, and he encouraged us. Well, the third time we searched him out, the first time again, he moved off the ledge, to start putting a person here up on the shuttle to begin to make these serious professional interests. Well, then there was a challenge of disaster, and uh, it was all uh, put aside. Now it's 30 years later. We have in space some extraordinary examples of what can be done when people want to see things done for economic reasons. We have the satellite communications business, which is now at about $10 billion a year in gross revenue. These are the direct, direct, not the programmatic content, but the direct space expenditures, satellites, ground stations, launches, that sort of thing. We've got the beginnings in GPS, nav stop, position fixing, navigation, about $2 billion a year, growing very rapidly. So we know it can be done. Human space flight, zip. We have no business at all. A little bit of space after privatization. And where we have maybe spent billions on R&D in the satellite communications area, we have spent hundreds, hundreds of billions of dollars in the human space flight area. So that's what's behind a great deal in the Washington universe of consideration about space tourism now finally. Finally, uh, last year, 30 years approximately after my first discussions with Herman, an agreement, a formal agreement was reached between the Space Transportation Association and NASA to start a cooperative a study to ask the question, what should the United States do to begin a large space tourism business? And I'm deeply involved in that with some people over at NASA as well. Why, after all this time, is, and he was absolutely correct, two years ago even, uh, space tourism lectures were very uh, rare, practically non-exit. Why is it now uh, 
and that we are beginning to get serious attention paid. I'll give you five reasons. There have been market studies made. In the 1980s, there were polls conducted that did say a large number of people seemingly would visit space if they could safely, reliably, and at a price they could afford. But polls have been conducted both in Japan and in the United States of America that suggest rather convincingly that a large number of people could visit space under those circumstances and would and we could look forward to having a business that might reach as much as the satellite communications business today. That is to say, some $10 billion a year. Second, we are in the midst, and those of you in the other room uh, an hour ago heard the people talk about the X-33 program. We now expect that we will undertake, not sure yet, the President has yet to make a decision, uh, the, uh, the X-33 program will get rdt and &E funding on a core shared basis with the space industry. But we will then be faced, assuming technological success, with financing the uh, follow-on commercial vehicle fleet. There will not, repeat, not be $10 billion of federal money available for that. And so we've got to get private sector money, and that means the money will have to look like a good investment, and that is why it is very important not only to have government markets, but private sector markets, and it looks as though of all the markets we can think of, the one that would be uh, earliest, most easily imagined, largest, would be that of space tourism. By the way, you don't have to R&D the payload. People just tend to come along. Third, the technology is moving on. We do see in the X-33, we've got people of Kistler, a large number of smaller groups are working on less ambitious approaches to uh, space surface LEO uh, transportation than are the X-33 people. And we have now the, uh, some outside influences and the novel characters such as the X-Prize. And I do have the sense in talking very my space transportation act that there's a great deal of ferment now, a great deal of technological ferment in the space transportation area, which uh, was uh, absent for the previous uh, 20 or 30 years. You know, all of our rockets are munitions. They're what we use to fire, basically, uh, atomic bombs, nuclear bombs. And we've got to do things very, very difficult in that. If we're ever going to see the prices come down and people be able to depend us uh, uh, on them working and put their lives on the, on the line. The fourth, Japan. Japan started thinking very seriously about space tourism about three or four years ago. And uh, has written a large number of papers. They've conceived of the kinds of vehicles that might be involved. They made the market studies that I referred to earlier. They were made not only in Japan, but they Japanese interest made in the United States. I had uh, spoken to the I know people in Japan who were doing these studies. I thought that we could get studies of that character done in the United States, but I failed to uh, see them happen. We're trying again now uh, to see more focused studies of markets in the United States. The Japanese Rocket Society has decided that its highest human spaceflight area priority will be that of space tourism. And now the last reason. All of the reasons I've advanced to this point have been uh, have been economically related ones. And the one I haven't mentioned at all, and that is, of course, simply that a large number of people want to go to space if they didn't, if they wouldn't have this need. Uh, if you ask what is quintessential American about our present federal civil space program, I find myself somewhat at a loss for words. If you examine what we're doing in space, I suggest that it would be just as reasonable, or we would just as well expect, a large number of other nations to do those things. Uh, making studies of the, uh, I don't know if it's detail, but you can, you can uh, find easily what it is that we're doing in space if you put your mind to it. I suggest that the American character must make its imprint now on space. We did it in Apollo, and now in a different fashion, we must do it in space. 
If you go back to American history, and I don't strike these remarks in the total history sense, I'm talking about the character of the country. We have people who, when we want something to happen, when we're personally deeply involved in it, we want to be directly and personally associated with it, moving it ourselves. Uh, I find it simply unacceptable, simply unacceptable, that all of the Americans go to space, or that America brings to space, our government employees, technicians, such as myself as a technician, or a guest of the government. I think that the, uh, it is my judgment that this uh, is not only a mistake on the part of our civil space program leaders, it has been for the past 30 years, but it's been a goddamn blunder, an awful blunder, and we are finding the results of it now in the budgetary treatment being given to the, uh, to the federal civil space program. It's a very great difficulty, and it springs from the fact that what the government is doing just doesn't appeal to enough people in the general public. The federal civil space program has lost is uh, is general public constituents. Uh, you here are uh, here because you're associated with the National Space Society. It came out in the Ad Astra not so long ago. A large number of papers dealing with space tourism. It's a fine, it's a fine uh, assembly of papers. And those of you that haven't seen them, I urge you to look at them. And I would hope and indeed trust that the National Space Society will uh, will. Uh, be an activist group, perhaps the most active group on space tourism in the United States. And I'll close and take another 30 seconds because Dan Goldman said something that, uh, that I hadn't expected him to say. He said he wanted his, grand he wanted his grandson to go to space. Why don't we speed up the process? I'd like to go. speaker, uh, Lawrence Roberts. Uh, Larry is uh, a trustee of the XPRIZE Foundation. He is a professor, a uh, member of the NSS Policy Committee, uh, chair of the American Bar Association Committee on International Space Law, uh, and despite all that, he's still a nice guy. Larry Roberts. <laughs> It's been said that uh, lawyers are taking over the world. Uh, as a former practicing attorney, I can tell you that that is absolutely not true. Uh, law and lawyers already have taken over the world. Um, everything we do, uh, whether it's uh, how we work, how we play, uh, from baseball to banking, from medicine to mining, is influenced by uh, the laws we pass or the laws we pass for ourselves. Uh, as I look around the room, in fact, uh, as a former real estate attorney, I can see about five or six laws right now. Uh, the exit sign, the number of uh, exits themselves, the sprinklers, the lighting. Um, and of course, my personal favorite, occupancy by more than 388 persons is dangerous and unlawful. Um, there is no reason to think that uh, the outer space regime is going to be any different than anything we do on Earth. Um, if that is indeed the case, 
then the best thing we can hope for is to regulate uh, space commercialization properly. Uh, to me, that means one to try and encourage as much, much as possible market mechanisms uh, so that they are less prone to abuse, they're self-regulating, self-adjusting. Uh, it basically makes life a whole lot easier. Uh, that doesn't mean that the market is the solution to everything. Uh, sometimes there are structural problems with the market, and so it is necessary to correct them in other ways, uh, such as when you create uh, commons problems, environmental problems are typically commons difficulties. And when all is said and done, and you've taken care of the market issues and the market problems, uh, at the end of the day, it might also be nice to promote uh, space tourism directly uh, for reasons other than purely economic. Uh, there are a number of documents uh, that pertain to space law. Uh, I put a few of them up here on the view graph. Uh, certainly not a complete list by any means. Uh, to a certain extent, every piece of space law has an impact on uh, space commercialization generally and space tourism in particular. Uh, what we have here is just uh, separated uh, into two basic categories here. Uh, we have Space Treaty, the Liability Convention, Moon Treaty, International Agreements, uh, NASA Act, uh, FCC provisions, and the uh, Commercial Space Transportation Regs and another. Uh, basically, uh, the current space law regime can be classified with three simple problems. Uh, there is the problem of absence. Uh, a good example of this would be in the moon tree. There is no property regime. Can't do anything unless you know <laughs> what kind of property you're going to have, how you're going to transfer, etc. There are problems of vagueness. Uh, an excellent example of this is that nowhere in any of these international agreements is outer space defined. It's discussed, but no one knows exactly where it starts. Uh, then, of course, there are problems of overregulation. Uh, when you get regulatory authority, perhaps uh, in the FCC, uh, where it might be perhaps a little bit too restrictive, uh, where you want a little more market flexibility than what you have right now. Now, while space tourism might operate in a physical vacuum, it doesn't necessarily operate in an economic vacuum. Uh, the kinds of issues that affect space commercialization generally are also going to affect space tourism. I mean, after all, the cost of launching someone into space is going to be the same whether you're launching a person to do scientific research or to put them up on a space hotel. Uh, the kinds of issues we have up here now, obstacles to growth, uh, I've begun with something I call the regulatory bottleneck, which is basically an idea that if you're going to have regulation, invariably there are, creates uh, problems uh, that reduce the effectiveness of the market. Uh, you see this very frequently in the Food and Drug Administration, where it takes years to get approval for a particular drug. In the meantime, people are doing without the benefit of the drug and companies are losing profits. Uh, the same thing happens uh, in commercial space as well, with the uh, Office of Commercial Space Transportation. Right now, there aren't that many launches that require a heavy need for standardization, uh, regular process, or transparency. Uh, but as time goes on, as the launch rate increases dramatically, you're going to see a need for that type of change in regulation. Uh, you'll also have to see uh, brand new regulations coming up, the kinds of things that you want for space hotels. Uh, those kinds of things take a lot longer because they're brand new issues and uh, requires that much more debate and that much more drag on the market, so just putting something up right away. Next problem growth, the financial hurdle. Uh, first question, of course, is, is this even a problem at all? I mean, after all, you listen to Boeing and they'll say, well, we put up uh, a 767 without any government support. What do uh, we need with financial support for other purposes? Well, that may be so, but the more risk you have, the less likely it is that you're going to uh, invest on a very large capital project, especially, or even if, 
uh, the benefits are patent. Uh, and the fact is that uh, every single major new capitalized transportation system has had some form of government support. Uh, whether it's uh, the Midwest Canal System in the mid-19th century, uh, the Transcontinental Railroad, uh, aviation, which had uh, the air mail system, or the automobile, which had the interstate highway system. The question then becomes, how do you support the space commercialization industry? Now, most of these direct incentives are, are typically less desirable than a more indirect support. Uh, tax incentives, duty-free zones, uh, a little bit more flexible, they allow the market to work a little bit better. Uh, an example of what something that might look like, uh, the Space Business Incentives Act, which right now is in congressional limbo, uh, gives you an idea of something like what would eventually come about. Uh, deductions for investments in space centers or uh, space corporations, uh, exemptions from tariffs for American launched products that return to the United States, uh, those sorts of activities. Uh, they provide a little more flexibility while still providing the support uh, for uh, a novel technology. Sometimes uh, the issue isn't so much restrictions to growth, but problems that are created because of growth. Space debris is a perfect example of that. Uh, it's an environmental hazard, perhaps a very immediate environmental hazard, when objects are whizzing by 35,000 kilometers an hour. Uh, but an environmental hazard nonetheless. Uh, it's especially uh, a significant problem for tourism, because you're going to have significant numbers of human beings going up into orbit, exposing themselves to that type of vulnerability. And those people may not necessarily be as well trained as uh, the current uh, core of astronauts that we have today. Uh, there are possible solutions to this. Uh, some of them already exist. You take remedial measures. Uh, there are other ways as well. You have uh, liability protection that uh, gradually increases the cost uh, in relation to the amount of potential debris that's created the, and the risk involved. There are also one or two peripheral issues that are involved here, uh, issues that affect growth in other industries that also affect the economies of scale uh, for the industry as a whole. Uh, most obvious ones are the trade issues, uh, the uh, launch rate limitations, uh, on uh, geosynchronous satellite launch for American satellites. Uh, the missile technology control regime uh, is another good example which limits the free transfer of uh, technology to increase the launch rate. Uh, communications regs which tend to stifle an increase in the available number of slots. And of course, uh, for the long term, uh, extraterrestrial property rights, which would presumably encourage development on the moon, which would then lower the launch rate or the transfer of the infrastructure to a, a hotel on the surface. Now we come to the issues uh, that affect uh, tourism specifically. And there's probably one that's a little bit more significant than the rest of them. Uh, I want to make sure I was clear on this one. Uh, and this is a good example of the difference between theory as an academic and practice. Uh, my work uh, with Peter and Colette here has uh, <laughs> led me to the difference what real liability really means versus what everyone thinks liability means. Uh, here uh, at the XPRIZE Foundation, we have been uh, trying to raise money, obviously, for uh, the final prize. And the issue that comes up from time to time with the donors is, well, if I give the money for this prize, I don't want to be sued. I don't want a situation where some crazy person uh, jumps off uh, his neighbor's roof with uh, you know, some nitrous oxide and some rocket fuel and blows a giant crater in uh, where his neighbor's house used to be. Uh, it doesn't matter that from a legal standpoint, there is no liability for the donor. It makes no difference whatsoever. Uh, number one, the problem is, of course, is the perception of the donor. 
who, no matter how much you convince them, is not going to be convinced to the tune of $10 million uh, that it makes absolutely no difference. Uh, discovery proceedings, they're going to have to deal with their attorneys, which they don't necessarily want to do, uh, as scintillating a conversation as it might be. Uh, <laughs> so, the idea is to keep the issues to a minimum, so you're going to need some kind of protection. What this typically means is legislative protection. Uh, there are a number of different approaches you can take to that. Uh, you can have uh, federal protection, which has its own advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the advantage, of course, is that if you get federal legislation passed, no matter what state in the union you launch from, the donor is protected. The, di uh, the problems, of course, is that <laughs> if anyone has ever tried to get anything passed through uh, Congress, it's not the easiest process in the world. And particularly in this particular case, you've got a situation in which <coughs> Uh, particular legislation is ne neither fish nor foul. Uh, so it faces the question of which committee has jurisdiction, and then you get into a whole other set of fights. Uh, the other problem, of course, is that no matter how extensive the legislation, uh, you're still dealing with a suborbital issue here. Uh, because if something lands in France, the federal legislation really isn't going to do you that much good. Uh, the other alternative is state protection. Uh, the advantage, of course, is that it's easier. Uh, the states have a more vested interest in seeing uh, corporations launch from their particular launch site. Uh, so they're more intent on getting past the smaller uh, pond. It, it makes life a little bit easier. Uh, this advantage, of course, is that you're only you're limited to launching in that particular state that you get the legislation passed in. And once again, you're limited to suborbital activity, perhaps even more suborbital than before, uh, because you pretty much have to stay within the state confines. Uh, eventually, uh, international protection is going to be necessary. Uh, the obvious advantage is international, doesn't matter how far you go, you're safe. Uh, the most likely ultimate solution is going to be uh, a modification of the Warsaw Convention, which was created for aviation. It established liability caps for the uh, aviation carriers in exchange for which they accepted a lower standard of proof for the plaintiffs. So what ends up happening is the plaintiffs get their money, but they're limited to a certain amount. Uh, everyone's pretty much happy, uh, and everyone goes home. Uh, the disadvantage, of course, is that it makes uh, trying to get something passed through Congress a walk, in the, uh, a walk in the park by comparison, uh, because you have to deal not only with uh, the federal government, you have to deal with every other government uh, of any significance on the planet. Uh, now, I don't want to leave you with the impression that liability is the only issue involved in space tourism. There are also environmental questions. Uh, has anyone uh, ever been to Yellowstone Park? Seen Old Faithful? Uh, I, I did not know this before, but apparently Old Faithful isn't. Uh, it, it doesn't uh, erupt every uh, hour on the hour. Uh, part of that is because of the changes in the geological substructure, but also it's because tourists like to drop things into the geyser and see what happens. Well, what ultimately happens is, is that it's disrupting the flow of water through uh, the geyser, and it's taking longer and longer for the geyser to erupt uh, each time. This, you're going to have similar issues when you're talking about outer space, particularly if you're talking about the moon. Uh, I mean, who wouldn't want to step in Neil Armstrong's footprints? Uh, there's going to have to be some kind of regulation which restricts that type of activity. Uh, okay, probably the most significant problem though isn't really a legal problem, it's a policy problem. Uh, the law by its nature is a very conservative institution. Uh, the idea is if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, you keep things the way they are. Status quo is always preferred. This is generally a good thing. Uh, it allows people to conduct activities without serious fear of being stopped over the short term. The, okay. uh, the problem is, of course, with a high-risk, high-capital investment like uh, space, uh, this is a very bad thing because there's no reliability involved. You have no way of planning uh, to make investments, to do business plans, uh, to conduct the research you need in order to start a long-term venture, such as space commercialization. Uh, what you get then is 
what I call uh, space policy catch-22. You have a situation where it's very difficult to pass legislation because you don't have the business support infrastructure to push the agenda through. But on the other hand, you can't have a constituency without the legislation to promote the business in the first place. Uh, there are possible solutions. Of, I mean, some of them are right here, right now. Uh, the National Space Society, uh, the X Prize is a perfect example. Uh, the Space Frontier Foundation, what they're doing. Uh, they're trying to promote certain types of positive policy agendas uh, without tremendous uh, business constituencies. Uh, in the end, though, uh, the only thing that's going to uh, resolve this issue is just the passage of time and uh, a little bit more progress. And thank you very much. Going to space, and I just like to add another one. Get away from the waters. <laughs> no, not not on my space no. <laughs> Um I would like to uh, put that right there. Um, it's good to know what the offense is going to throw at you, so you can prepare for it and plan against it. And Larry, Larry is able to help us do that. Uh, our our fifth speaker um, is uh, doesn't look like Buzz Aldrin, but. Uh, my former program is we're, we're very uh, happy to have Rand Simber join us this, this evening. Uh, Rand uh, spent two years at Aerospace Corporation, 11 years with uh, Rockwell, and in 1993 founded Interval Space Lines, and uh, focusing on space tourism, and is now offering a zero G parabolic ride. Uh, Rand, if you could join us. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. <coughs> Peter gave me three challenges today. Uh, first, I have to follow all the other speakers, uh, which is tough in itself. I have to debunk Aldrin. Uh, I'd have to do it in 10 minutes. But never fear, I have view graphs. If this talk seems a little bit disjointed, it's only because it is. Uh, it's really a Siamese twin of a couple briefings that I pulled together uh, that I thought would fit in the theme of what we're trying to do here today. Uh, these briefings are things I've been going around talking about the entertainment industry and the aerospace industry in an attempt to, if not, actually shatter paradigms, which is usually very tough to do, at least put some stress cracks in them. Uh, so what I want to talk about is I think maybe help some of the paradigm shift along here too, though I think I'm probably talking to the choir a lot more than some of the audiences I've been dealing with. I want to talk about how tourism, uh, tourism in the entertainment industry and what I call the new space age. Uh, just to kind of set the stage a little bit, we ought to remember that uh, the entertainment industry helped set the stage for the original space age. Uh, Von Braun teamed up with Disney back in the mid-50s, uh, did a series of TV specials, which were on the Disney show on, on Sunday night. Uh, he did a series of uh, articles in Colliers, and that really acquainted people with, with some of the, uh, what it was going to be like and uh, what they could anticipate when they actually started to have a space program. Uh, here's a little bit of just drawing the part, but this is kind of like a docking experiment I like to use just to get people to move and understand the difference between a space program the way it might be and the way it is. Uh, imagine if air travel were like space travel today. Uh, I used this in California, so that was the example that I used. If you want to go, say, fly from LA to San Francisco this weekend, and you're going to do it the way the space industry does it, you, you, go, you raise your money because it's going to cost a lot. You, you go no shape, buy a vehicle, you manufacture, you hire a trainer crew, you find other passengers who want to go along with you, they're trying to reduce the cost. You hire your lawyers, like Larry over here, and get your license from the government, wait for good money, you fly to San Francisco, and then invest in addition of the industry to destroy your vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> then you have to repeat if necessary to come back. Um, if you were smart, you bought two vehicles in the first place, so at least you, you got a little bit of economies of scale there. The bottom line is that you're going to spend several hundred million dollars for your round trip ticket to San Francisco for the weekend, and you get there 18 months from now, and you'll come back maybe six months after that. Obviously, if this were the way air travel were, the skies over San Luis Obispo would not be black with airplanes. Now, just to touch on another point, um, one of the reasons we don't do this is because we just haven't had the market. 
space is a very limited activity, and that's why it costs so much. We just don't have the economies of scale. And part of that reason is because payloads cost so much. But as Tom pointed out, there is a very good red mark out there. The, two, the payloads are already built. Uh, and they're ready to go. Uh, very low manufacturing cost, very simple payload interface, or basically a seat, uh, and a seat belt, and a keister. It works fine with the airlines, and it will work fine here. Uh, I was out on Ellis Island yesterday, or the day before yesterday, uh, looking over some of the, the history of, of the immigration. And there was a, a phrase in one of the, um, the panels there that was both felicitous and very resonant with, I could pull around one of the business plans. They were talking about the transition from going to sailing ships to steamer ships and, and carrying passengers to steerage. And, and the, the wording was, uh, the owners of the ships found passengers to be both profitable and self loading <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, space tourism is going to be the same way, I think, for the RLD manufacturers once they really understand it and do the market research they need to take it to heart. The other thing to keep in mind is that tourism is a already a tremendous industry. It's really a trillion dollar industry when you look at all the recreation travel and entertainment. Actually, it's even bigger than that when you throw into the whole entertainment industry. So, so why isn't it happening? Well, as has already been pointed out, we're kind of living with an historical accident called the Cold War. Um, we had a national imperative to beat the Russians to the moon. It didn't really matter how much it cost, just because it never matters how much it costs when you're in a war. You gotta win the war. Uh, and we're still living today with the legacy of that mentality. All of the launch vehicles, the first order, are derived from munitions. And this is not a passive friendly way of delivery. I mean, you don't want to, I mean, Jules Verne had the idea of going out of cannon, but you know, that's really not practical. Uh, the other, other thing that happened because of the associated with Cold War is we had national security issues that have isolated industry, both from the public and from, from the entrepreneurs. Very, they don't even talk to each other, even within the company, because of all the, if something's classified, it's classified. You don't need to know, you're not going to know. So there's a lot of technology out there that uh, it's very hard to apply, and it's very hard for somebody in a garage to start up and use some of the stuff that's been developed in the past 30 years. And it's also bread industry is kind of was fat, dumb, and happy, and kind of cost plus contracts. And it never, never, ever thought about consumer demand, so it really wasn't anything like aviation days. So as I said, we're kind of stuck in a paradigm we need to break out of. Uh, another problem that came out of the space program was the mythic culture of NASA. Uh, it promotes this mythology that you can't even visit space without being some kind of superhuman. Uh, months of training is obviously going to turn somebody off. In fact, there are people, John Denver would, might even have been willing to pay what it cost to visit the Russian space station, but he didn't want to have to learn Russian and spend six months in Russia going through a training process to do that. And you, you're, apparently you're not even allowed to die in space without being being special somehow. I mean, people die on the freeway every day, but, but we're afraid to send another school teacher up because we killed the first one. And the bottom line is that there's still this sense that only NASA can do the space stuff. But we've got to change this whole mentality because the right stuff is not the way you're going to go about the space tourism industry. So as a result of all that, we've got a whole history and a culture that it hasn't even allowed us to think about it, to even dream about it. Uh, my experience, and I'm just talking to the general public, is that there's kind of two attitudes towards, you know, personally going to space. One is that uh, space is expensive, it's dangerous, it's always going to be, and we shouldn't even talk about this as a privilege use of it, you know, we've got to do important things in space and not sending people up. And the other attitude is, it's amazing how many people think, you know, that Star Trek is just around the corner and we're already doing all of this stuff. And in both cases, they really don't understand the real story because nobody in either the media or the industry is telling them to them. And that, that is, the space is currently expensive and dangerous, but it does not have to be. And we aren't doing much to change that, but we could be. So just to recap, what's happened in the last 40 years, we beat the Russians to the moon, we won the Cold War, we built a massive federal space bureaucracy, and we're spending more on space, but actually even in the 90s we're not even spending more on space, we're spending less on space and getting even less than what we spend. And all the dreams we had back in the 50s from Collier's, and uh, all the rides that are in Tomorrowland that came out of that and come from Fantasyland.
So we're sitting right in the middle of the cusp of a transition from what I call the old space age to a new one. Uh, the Cold War is over. All those motivators are gone. The bugs declining. On the other hand, you have a growing population. The baby boomers are moving through that uh, demographic snake like a picture of Python. And, and they've got their kids through school. They've raised all their yuppie puppies. They've got their houses paid for. And they're going to want to have new things to do with their money. And the other thing that's happening is that uh, since we've at least somewhat thrown off a lot of the shackles of communism, there's a lot of growth out there in the rest of the world. And that's going to provide a big market. The technology base is maturing very rapidly as a result of what we've been doing for the last 20 or 30 years, particularly on the electronic side of the world. And we have all this rapid communication capability now in place with the internet. So you've really got a critical mass in place for all these new space industries. You've got the market, you've got the capability. So the point I really want to make is that maybe the people we need to be talking to is go back to Disney, or go talk to Paramount, go talk to MCA, half cities. Uh, this is an interesting chart I put up just to kind of compare and contrast the old space age and the new space age. Uh, we're talking about the past space age versus the future one. We're talking about ones driven by science, national security, uh, all those kind of federally funded things as opposed to one that's driven by opportunity and wealth, and most particularly, it's going to be driven by tourism and entertainment. Uh, instead of government-funded, it's going to be private enterprise, it's going to be entrepreneurial, as opposed to bureaucratic. It's going to have a lot of low-cost ventures, all the X Prize, as opposed to a very few, very large-scale efforts. Uh, instead of sending a few government employees in space, we're going to open it up to the people. Instead of having a secretive, and isolated program, we're going to have everybody involved and aware of it working with it. And instead of a nationalistic one, we'll have a global and a little plug for my company there, we had a global space <laughs> So what we really need to do is start working with those entertainment companies, maybe go back to them and say, let's do what we did in the 50s, we'll do the 90s version of it. Let's prepare the public for the new space program. Uh, put out some new multimedia things on the web. Let's uh, do some more shorts in the theaters. Let's have some more TV specials. Uh, let's have some, a, a series of specials on space tourism. We'll do some market research. Uh, have audience participation. Uh, maybe Life Magazine can do a series of articles. We've got to start getting the real story out to the public and start talking about not creating jobs, because you can do that by paying people to move home from one side of Nebraska to the other, but by creating wealth. And that's all I've got.
Do we anticipate any problems from the government uh, for people attempting to uh, launch manned suborbital vehicles? I, I can't answer your question specifically, but you can bet that the X-33 people are really sweating that one. They're going to have to do it. I, I will add to that that let's not lose the race again because your damn gear has to get in the way. Let's get the right info. And that's hopefully some, some type of a, uh, a spear we can use to shape the regulations. Yeah, we, we have been working uh, with Frank Weaver, who heads the Office of Commercial Space Transportation, and we've met with Secretary Kenya about this, and there is support to make it happen. Next question. Go ahead. Doug Messier is interested about the validity of market surveys. Um, how are you doing a, a huge one with NASA? Will it be valid? There's nothing specific about markets. Sir. All I can say, uh, I can say two things. One, the market surveys that were done by the Japanese interests, so far as we can tell, are as good as you can do, but you do them that way. But we also know that there have got to be more specific and more focused surveys made, and uh, we're thinking about seeing if some of them are done. In fact, uh, I've talked with Lori herself about this, and Peter, Peter's active. Uh, and let me uh, ask Colette to say a couple words about um, something which was, was far beyond a market survey but was done 10 years ago, Project Space Voyage. 10 years ago, we conducted a survey right after President Reagan commercialized space. We were a group of people with an adventure travel agency that were, the average trip was around $35,000 in 1984, 85 dollars. We asked our clientele if we let them go into space for $50,000 and if they took a new spacecraft, a vertical lift, vertical launch, which today we know is the DCX, but 10 years ago it was shuttle country, would they be willing to go? Within a six month period, I collected deposits, $7,000 checks, 252 people sent money knowing that it was going in an escrow account. We know there's a financially viable market, which Tom and others will be tapping into. That's probably the most solid if you would market survey done today. Uh, we have some more questions. Yes, please. Uh, I just want to look at the survey that we had last quarter that we did that type of chapter from the first quarter. Yes, let me answer, answer that. Uh, that was, in fact, done uh, cooperatively between the National Space Society and the X-Prize Foundation. Uh, we collected uh, somewhere around 1,500 responses to that survey. And uh, we are, our target is 5,000 responses, quite frankly. And Colette and I and others are working uh, now to get that distributed further and farther. And we're now, <laughs> sorry, nothing personal. Uh, we're now beginning the uh, processing of that data. So we hope to, to publish that. And unfortunately, it hasn't been processed yet. It's uh, now in the hands of an NSS uh, uh, intern who is entering it in and, and will publish that as soon as possible. One more very quick comment. Going back to what Rand Sindberg had to say, you've got to learn how to merchandise space all over again. The old paradigm doesn't work. It doesn't fit. You've got to start over again. Sir. Yes. Uh, Harlan's about to do a slam dunk on the space industry this summer. You've got IV4 coming out, you've got the arrival coming out, and there's another science fiction film coming out that basically all about evil aliens attacking the Earth. Absolutely right. You know, uh, they're, they're putting, it seems to me, they're putting the American public back to the 1950s isolationist mentality, body snatchers, etc. We want to move forward. How do you think the X Prize Foundation can help? Offset paranoia is about to come out of films like this. From, well, that's, from that's a great question, and I applaud you for that uh, for that observation. Uh, the the dream here, the dream is that in three years' time, we're going to have twenty odd teams who are bringing together the best and brightest. And they're going out, they're getting funding, like Rand said, from Disney, or they're getting funding from NHK or from 
wherever it might be around the world, and they are building their rockets. And we're going to have on CNN Live, on ABC, on Russian and Japanese networks, teams launching. And it is going to be a, a billion viewer marketplace. And we're going to see folks who are going to do amazing things and then turn around and like that little video clip we saw earlier, take their companies public and start offering people rides. And we want to take it out of the world of fiction and into the world of reality. So we've got the America's Cup of Space. One of the things that we announced in, in St. Louis I didn't mention, we announced, I mean, for this group is important, we announced three things. One is the X Prize itself, that's been funded over a million dollars this far. The second thing is we announced something called the New Spirit of St. Louis Awards. Every year at the St. Louis Science Center, in cooperation with the city, we are going to be awarding four $25,000 cash awards to individuals like yourselves. These are $25,000 in cash for those individuals who during the past year did the most to support space tourism. Don't have to be an engineer, it could be for the best policy work, or the best medical work, or the best architectural work, whatever it might be. You need not apply. We're going to have an international group that's going to go up and tap you on the shoulder and say, congratulations, here's your 25 case, the uh, MacArthur Award of Space. The second thing that we're doing is after the XPRIZE is won, we are going to be having on a biennial basis, every two years, we're going to be having something called uh, the New Spirit St. Louis Cup, which is modeled after the America's Cup, which will take place out at the St. Louis Spaceport, which is now an objective to be built, and it's probably six, seven, eight years down the line. But every two years, teams are going to be invited there during the month of May for one month period to try and set new altitude records, new number of people carried, uh, quickest turnaround times, lowest cost per flight, and just keep on moving the technology economic equation forward. And we hope those sorts of things start getting people's attention more than human eating aliens. I think it's a time for recreating and building real heroes. We don't have to have science fiction heroes anymore. There's an awful lot of amazing technology and intellect right here in this room. And that's what the X Prize is going to help provide as a vehicle for today's heroes. I think one other thing we need to do is, is to get in there, because you know, all this inspirational stuff is great. It gets, it's so exciting, but it uh, doesn't necessarily sell a Hollywood executive. He's, he's not going to do a movie unless he believes that it's going to work the box office. You need to get more concepts in there that are pitching positive kinds of things. Uh, and, and it would be nice if we could have, have a breakthrough movie that, that shows that this kind of stuff does sell. And then it's, it's always easy, because then there are going to be 10 clones of the thing if you, if you can get one of them through. More questions? Well, folks, in that case, it's 535. Thank you for coming to the session and have a great evening.